SCN two A variant. Oops. <laughs> Uh, SCN 2A variant interpretation using new web tools. This session is being recorded, as you just heard. My name is Leah Myers, and I'm the executive director for the Families SCN 2A Foundation. We are so excited to bring this virtual educational experience to our global community. During these sessions, the families and caregivers, you all, will be referred to as the experts, and the presenters will be the professionals. The goal of these virtual table talks is to allow experts unprecedented access to professional researchers and clinicians working diligently to find a cure for our children. This is meant to be a very casual environment and your questions and comments are encouraged um, as we're all here to learn from one another. To keep things running smoothly, please keep your audio on mute and use the reaction button to raise your hand if you would like to talk. Or you can send questions through the chat if you haven't already, please introduce yourself and your child in the chat, perhaps maybe their name, age, how SCN2A presents, like for example, do they have autism, epilepsy, or both, and where you live. Okay, so I now have the pleasure to hand this over to a longtime friend and dedicated scientific advisor to the foundation, Dr. Dennis Lau from the Cleveland Clinic and the Broad Institute. Dennis, thank you so much for being here. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, um, Leah. I'm very happy to uh, um, present today. And um, um, I, I, I think it's 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 a why when I talked actually at like in a family centered um, context for SCN two A. I think it was already three years ago, or was when I was together with a, um, AJ and near Pennsylvania and like a small uh, conference. I think it was the second um, SN2A conference. So, yeah. So I will talk today. I'd, I will show some slides, but I, um, I don't consider this really as a presentation. It's just an overview of a couple of things we are doing. And, um, and I hope um, this uh, will be helpful. So I just um, try to move. Um, through these slides um, relatively quick that we have it, um, at the end a good amount of time to discuss things and um, yeah feel uh, feel free to um, ask questions so um, I will talk a little bit about um, um, my research group and what we are doing and um, so then a little bit about one project which is not yet ready for SCN2A um, but um, it is ready for a different disease, and I will show you what we soon will also have for um, SCN2A. So, um, as Leah mentioned, um, I'm um, Dennis. I work at the Cleveland Clinic um, and have also some other roles in different institutions. Um, I'm specialized on, um, inter um, yeah, on epilepsy genetics, uh, I would say. That's a very broad topic, but um, that's uh, probably true and this includes also like a little bit a little bit biology but also a little bit um, clinical um, aspect of this so um, as member of the scientific advisory board over the years i um, guess i have um, learned quite a bit things relevant to the disease and um, happy to answer questions so overall <clears throat> i'm leading um, a relatively large research research group um, where we focus on um, understanding um, what is going on in people with drug resistant epilepsy. And um, we um, typically expect that genetics play a role. And then once we identify this, for example, um, the, once we learned that SCN2A plays a role, we tried um, try really to in uh, integrate clinic into um, the, uh, uh, the genetics into the clinic and really improve, trying to improve diagnostics and at the end um, enable better treatment. But at the same time, we also try to um, educate, um, you know, medical doctors and um, everyone who is involved or exposed to um, genetic um, disorders, including families. So, and I will show you about this a little bit later. And once we have learned some things and we try to make that useful, these lessons we learned um, for many, many other genetic disorders um, to help many, as many people as possible. So um, this is basically the reason why we get up in the morning. So overall, um, my group is um, focused um, on, it's relatively unusual. So um, we do a lot of um, computational research. So most of many, many, many research groups are either 
clinical researchers or they are molecular research researchers. We are not, we are not, we are neither. Um, we are basically working with many clinical scientists and working with many uh, basic researchers and um, take their data and try to make sense out of it or connect actually a lot of data points. So then you will see later what I mean with this. So, and this is also depicted here. So um, my research group um, are around about 17 people now, which is rather big. And um, most of the members of my team have like a genetics, computational science background and statistics background. However, we also have um, people who have a medical background in the team or biologists. So, and um, we work very collaboratively. So, um, and we, because we don't, um, because we are more, more like a connector um, and, um, or interpreter of uh, data. So we really um, like to talk to other people who are more experts, for example, on um, mouse studies or cell studies or clinical acid, um, your, um, characterization of your children. And we try to bring everything together and to make a combined interpretation. So quickly what our research group is doing is following this game plan. So we try to identify the reason why someone um, has an epilepsy. Um, typically our assumption is the genetics play somehow a role. Then we try to understand what type of genetic variants um, are specifically um, causing um, that disease in, for example, in a specific gene. Then we work with many clinicians together, try to figure out, is there some relationship um, between the gene or a specific mutation and the clinical representation of an individual? So, so we call this in research genotype, phenotype. And then we try to also to understand the mechanism we you know, um, and you have, might have heard that, for example, with SCN2A, there are multiple mecha mechanisms which at the end can lead to uh, the disease. We try to figure out, can we identify some rules which are associated with certain types of mutations, for example, certain positions, um, which lead to certain types of um, defects, which um, are correlated with, for example, um, different drugs which should be select selected for better care. So, and then we um, um, really try to um, take these lessons and um, make them clinically actionable. For example, we develop some some kind of um, com this, this, um, support for clinicians to make sense, like some kind of some risk calculators, for example. Then we try to educate um, globally um, um, clinicians, but also families to understand the disorder a little bit better um, and to be um, more actionable in the, in the in interaction with, for example, clinicians. And um, I come to this later and then we really try to um, use all our knowledge to um, find the best um, patient for the um, ongoing clinical trial or um, soon to be clinical trial so that the trial will be successful. So that's a little bit the overarching goal. And we have many, many projects at different parts of this um, game plan. So I will talk a little bit about um, the latter partner. Um, and um, this is research we have recently done and I don't need to show you these publications. So um, this is where um, a lot of members of my team at the moment spend a lot of energy, which um, is um, really br trying to bring all this knowledge what we have for certain genes or certain mutations um, to um, many um, people. And you know, why is that needed? So it's quite interesting. Um, even if we, for example, would talk only about SCN2A. So probably before 2010, there may be, well, maybe, I don't know, um, 20, 30 studies on SCN2A. Not, um, they're not really focused on clinic, it's just what um, the SCN2A gene does. But bet between 2010 and today, there are at least uh, 500 to 1,000 studies out there. I'm 100% sure about this. So they're not all relevant for, to understand the disorder, but still there's a lot of things going on. And the thing is, um, if, if you talk to an average neurologist, they will not know these studies. Even if you talk to an average pediatric neurologist, they will not know these studies. And this is a big problem. You know, um, There's so much knowledge and actually knowledge is increasing. And um, a lot of this knowledge is actually very useful for, if you want to, um, um, uh, provide the best care for um, your children. However, um, if um, a doctor is not um, is afraid of genetics, then you have a problem. 
And then people typically hope that the genetic counselor can cover this, but the genetic counselor typically also has to care for like 30, uh, 300 genes or something like this. And they also don't know all this information which comes out on a daily basis um, on through research. So um, this is, let's, this leads to a situation where we have um, maybe 30 people in the world which know really well what to do. And um, if they see a new child, for example, with S think 2A, um, um, but as you can imagine on not um, 30 people, are, you know, it's hard to get to these 30 people and or have regular um, um, encounters with them, which is it's a huge problem. And this will not change much. And so we, we tried we try to solve, um, um, and I just show you with, with this example for Grin2A now what I mean with this. And this, this is a really big problem. So, and I could do the same slide for SN2A, but I didn't find one study which really summarizes that elegant. But what I show you here applies very much also for SN2A. So we have this study here, which where they looked at um, people with Grin2A disorders. So there are studies like this also for SN2A and we published actually a couple of those. And the latest one was also published by Ingo, collaborator from us. Um, but this is a typical study what we do in genetics where we try to understand what is the clinical um, outcome of people with this disorder and are there some rules we can learn from this, this for specific mutations. So what you see here now is you need to have a really, really deep knowledge about um, the clinical spectrum specifically associated with that gene. So, for example, what you see here now that is um, and people with, uh, with grin 2 a disorders, they have sometimes normal development, and sometimes they have a very mild epilepsy with some language problems, and sometimes they have really severe intractability and really an epilepsy which is not treatable at all. And sometimes even people stop speaking. So it's a very big heterogeneous pattern, and th this is true for many of our epilepsy genes, including SCN2A, and as a doctor, you need to understand what is to be expected and what is not. So um, in terms of, so your understanding is that what, what a neurologist typically knows is um, what type of seizure, this is not really relevant here. You need to understand all, everything around it actually um, to make an assessment if you know, your patient truly has, um, for example, grin to a So that's one thing. So, but on the other hand, you need suddenly also have this genetic knowledge you, because what you see here is that there are different types of mutations, the so-called missense variants, and then you also have these nodal or truncating variants. So as a clinician, you suddenly need to be able, who is a neurologist who, for example, trained maybe 15 years ago and maybe had biology the last time in school 30 years ago, um, you suddenly have to have an idea what the difference is between a missense variant and a truncating variant, which is um, typically not really there. And the more complicated thing is, you have to know to understand these rules. And you see this, from, if you look at here, that these disease causing uh, missense variants, if they are sp at specific regions, and these are all these biolo biological terms here, they are associated with the severe disease, the version of the disease. So you need suddenly to understand really um, what this, how this gene, this molecule looks in the body. And then you learn also that there are other types of the same type of missense variants, which are located at a different position in the um, molecule, they lead to a, a less severe disease. So, and this really means that you um, have to suddenly be an expert on the really the hardcore biology. So knowledge, which usually on the computational chemist or um, computational biologist have. This is way beyond um, a um, neurologist has. They, they, they don't know proteins and these kind of things. So, and this is a big problem, right? So because you have very different mechanisms now going on here, which require different treatment. So, um, and this is a problem um, what we tried to um, overcome, you know, in the last years by, for example, giving in-person um, uh, in workshops. This is, um, we do this usually typically three times per year. And then you see here all these young ne neurologists or fellows or um, PhD students where we are genetic counselors, where we try to train them um, how to, you know, do these assessments. And this is nice, but uh, overall the footprint is still very low, right? So we, because um, these are only like 20 people in a room here and there's only so much you can do, right? So the next thing what we try to do is that we give um, workshops. Um, um, for, for example, this is a good workshop by the um, highest um, organization for epilepsy in the world, which is the um, International League Against Epilepsy. And um, I give a two hour seminar on how to make sense out of um, genetic tests and mutations. 
and you know, four thousand people looked at this in a year. But you know, is this enough? Pro probably not. So the next thing what we tried to do is um, we gave a conference where also, for example, people from the foundation were presenting the foundation um, at our conference where we had more than 300 attendees from 28 uh, countries. That was a conference um, I organized, um, I think, two years ago. So, but still, um, every time I go to um, conferences for neurologists or epileptologists, I still face um, the situation that um, I'm in a room where um, people know maybe a gene name, but they don't know what to do with the variants. And this is a big problem, right? So because clinical testing is everywhere, but um, interpretation is hard. And um, so my personal opinion is that um, our therapies will come faster um, before we, um, then we know which patients will really benefit from them. So because there's a lot of hope that therapies um, will be there in the next um, few years and really few years. And um, for some um, conditions and subconditions, they are actually already ad um, adjusted treatments, but you have to be certain which patient benefits, you know? Um, so for someone who has already uh, like a lower function, you don't want to push it further low. And for someone who has already increased function, you want to you don't want to increase it further, right? So you need to understand, um, you, you need to predict what's going on. So our um, latest approach to um, overcome um, or um, make the, um, the knowledge which is already there in the uh, community more accessible to people are building high, uh, is building online platforms which have all the information we experts have. So, and this is, you know, an example how, um, and I will come later uh, for the Grin genes, and I come later to an example, uh, to the prototype for the SCN genes, which is really a prototype. For the Grin genes, you can see, you know, that we developed like um, an interface where you can look, for example, for the gene Grin1, and you could, for example, in S for the sodium channels, you can like look at SCN2A, and then you learn a little bit what, you know, um, typically patients have with um, such um, a genetic disease. So which enables, for example, um, you to learn a little bit more about what is, are, for example, seizures rare, or is it a typical thing? And what is it um, something, or hypotonia, for example, or insurgency or ataxia? And then you, you can get a feeling um, what um, how your child looks, is it a little bit more, um, the typical one, uh, this, for example, then are the seizures um, are where most seizures start, and you get a, get a feeling for this. But the cool thing is, you can also show this to your doctor. So if that um, if your treating physician is not um, um, aware and um, in much detail about scn 2 disorders, they can go to this and um, 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 make their assessment more precise because they know know more what to look for and what to make more out of this. So. Um, and, and again, I will show you later a little bit the sodium channel version of this. So, and this data is quite cool because we have um, here in this um, web portal now data from registries. So this is um, expert curated clinical data, which um, 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 we have, for example, here for 150 patients. And this is otherwise not accessible. You have to go to hundreds of publications um, which are usually not accessible unless you pay for it. And you can get this information here now for free and you can learn a little about the diseases. And the cool thing is you can also compare your disease to, um, for example, a, a different SCN gene disorder. So you learn a little bit more what uh, specific, for example, for SCN2A, what is different in SCN1A. So you get a little bit um, an intuition for this. So um, what else? Let me see. So what else do we have? So the next thing is um, we have like a families tab and this is, um, um, I showed again, I showed this a little bit later for SCN2A, where we um, link out to family organizations, but um, I think I don't need to talk about this much more because you're already here at um, the meeting of a family organization. And we also have um, in this um, framework a video and where you can learn a little bit about the basics of the disease. And I show you at the later the SCN2A video, which we have already done. So um, that's um, why I just skipped through this a little bit fast now. So, and these videos are also translated um, in several languages. And we will, um, our goal is to have um, every video, also the Sodium Channel one or the SN2A one, translated in all major um, languages by experts. So that really, they're, they're, it's not computer generated, it's really 100% um, um, accurate. So that globally, um, um, people can learn about the, their disease. And to be very, very honest, I always say this is for families, but um, I, my personal opinion is that this also helps many neurologists. 
and which is um, very, uh, very helpful. And the good thing is for the sodium channels, we already have also drafted the um, scripts for the videos which are specifically made for neurologists. So that which have all the information they need to treat um, um, your children as best as possible. Um, and we are, yeah, these videos are hopefully will be done in the next um, four weeks. So, the, but the draft is already there and they have, and these drafts have been written and edited by the world leaders on clinical um, application in, um, of genetics in, for example, sc 2 So from the family tab, um, we also have um, now um, a little bit more um, 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 analytics in, embedded on this um, website. So because as you know best, variant interpretation is challenging and we have developed like an interface where, for example, a genetic counselor can submit a patient mutation. So, um, and as you can see here, for example, here you can type in the position of the mutation and then you can submit this. And then you learn, for example, if we have anyone in our registry which has the same um, variant. And you see, for example, and for this specific variant, we have a patient and the patient has also the de novo variant. And you can see already, you know, what kind of diseases um, that um, individual has. So for example, if you have a very young child, you might, um, you know, um, can um, you know get an idea um, what might be the problem of the future might be so but I would uh, just recommend to you know just use um, this so the sodium channel one is, is not online yet but it's just to learn a bit a little about the disease so what you also learn that not every um, variant is not everyone with the same variant looks exactly the same and that's quite that's actually the utility of this website so the cool thing is also and this is really important for the drug companies um, we have many, many variants fun um, um, add, anot so collected, which have been functionally tested. And for the sodium channels, we actually have way more. So we have, I think in total already 450 variants, which have been functionally tested um, in any one of the sodium channels. And um, I expect to receive from our molecular colleagues over the next month, at least like 500 more variants, which have been functionally tested. And then you can, um, um, learn about, um, for example, if you submit a variant that has been functionally tested, you can learn about the function. And this is really important if you consider, for example, as a neurologist or a pediatrician, um, to use a sodium channel blocker um, or not, because um, such medications make only sense if you think that the mutation causes a gain of function. So, and we have this information here um, um, that um, people who think about treatment can um, um, inform themselves. And I personally, um, um, believe that this will give also um, U.S. parents the ammunition to challenge um, maybe underutilization of genetics in clinical care because you can say, "Hey, look at this website. Um, have you? Cons um, I see that it's a gain of function. What do you think?" And if that person cannot respond, you should probably go to a different doctor. So, um, and I'm speaking as a scientist and just have an opinion which you can pretty pretty, pretty much dismiss. Um, Okay, so um, what we, um, so this is also some more advanced things which genetic, uh, very advanced genetic counselors can do. You can look if you, um, your mutation uh, or a sim maybe a similar mutation in a different sodium channel gene was found because that can also sometimes be useful for genetic variant interpretation. But this is more um, detailed, which I usually present for um, scientists, not even to neurologists. Um, but the, um, the cool thing is you can also really ask, um, you know, um, are there patients maybe which are not exactly like, um, uh, which I don't maybe not have the exactly same mutation like my child, but you can also look um, other variants which are at the similar region in the gene, because we in biology believe if the variant is in a similar region, then the function will be similar. And you can see this, for example, here by domain, this is like a bigger region. And you can see also all the functional effects. And you can see that, for example, in this domain where we have 20, 30 variants, none of them is loss of function, which is already guiding people that, um, hey, um, maybe um, here a blocker may make sense at this domain. So anyways, so, and this is um, a little bit more advanced and I don't want to go much into detail here. So um, what we, the, the good thing is what we have for the um, social channel genes um, is that we have like a, a variant interpretation algorithm here. So um, it's probably in the previous video, yeah. So um, where you can click on this, we don't have the sodium, sodium channels yet, but we are working on this, where you can look at the variant you submitted and you get an assessment. And the beauty about this is that um, this has information from the world leading experts in an algorithm included. 
So this will um, this has information if this is a variant is located at a very specific important region of the gene, um, and or for example have other patients been seen like that, or is, have healthy people been seen with that same variant. This is all things which um, genetic counselors will um, in, integrate in their assessment, but we do this here on a way deeper level because this website has been built by really the world leaders um, on that gene and the average um, genetic council doesn't have that knowledge um, you know they they don't they, they um, don't spend 100 percent of their time doing research on their gene they they, they help people um, interpreting genetic tests but they don't do research so um these things are not accredited and i have to tell you please don't use them um, but I, um, for, for learning purposes, I think they're very useful. And for the swim channels, again, we don't have that yet, but we're working on this and hopefully have this soon. So, um, and the last thing is, is a little bit more advanced research um, where we aggregate a lot of information, basically all clinical information, what we can get for um, all of these 500 individuals in this example here. And we take all the biological data and develop a platform where um, drug companies can now develop test hypothesis um, to, um, to um, really explore how mutations change at the end the molecule here. The, here you see the molecule of, um, for, this, um, for this group of genes and they can explore all the data we have publicly um, freely available. And I hope that really that makes um, um, think drug development um, hundred times faster because Everyone who has access to this publicly accessible website has all the information in the world um, at hand, and there is no hidden games or proprietary rights or something like this. Um, so that that should speed up things. Um, and everything is expert created. This is very important. It's not just um, a random data. So it's it's really high quality, and that should really make things move things forward. Okay. Um, I don't go much into detail here, so you can really look at you know where the mutation is located, what is the clinical um, degree of interest, for example, the degree of interestability here, or some really some molecular markers um, which biologists are interested in. But I don't want to go much into detail. So I was just briefly want to show you where we are um, with the sodium channel portal, and it's really um, um, you know. So uh, so I hope that um, by end of this week we have a more advanced version. Um, so um, yeah, the many people of my team are working on this. So and but I'm we have we definitely have it by mid, mid October because we uh, need to present it and otherwise we get problems um, at an at a conference. So at least one of my PhD students. But now we were working on this. So and we have some you know see this is random text that's not uh, filled in yet. So we have then here for example SC1 disorders. So then have we have SC2 disorders and we, we actually have already included some data. And um, so then we, um, and you can see that's when the typical onset and you can see by different types of um, groupings, but we might, we will make that way better. I actually don't want to show you this now because it's really embarrassing. So, um, but then we also have like the, the families tab and you know, here we have the um, a video, which is for all sodium channel genes, but we have also video specifically for SCN2A and I'll show you this in a second. Um, and then we have this variant analysis interfaces, which we know, which are blank yet, but we're filling them with all yes. these algorithms. Yeah. To interrupt. Um, so sorry to interrupt, but um, we're just seeing a, a, a slide that says the SCN portal is in development. Switch oh. To okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, that's yeah. That's uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, so that's um, that's the rough draft of the um, SCN portal. So, but it's empty, right? And this is ugly. So, but we work on this. So, and you can see, for example, like you had with the green genes here, you have now the sodium channel genes here. And you can look, for example, at um, um, the, um, you have, for example, at 387 patients, which were, which have data for um, SD2A. And you can see the main, um, you know, clinical uh, groupings, but this is not, you know, this is just for, inter for us here, right? So we will have already, by early next week, a very advanced version, and by mid October we will have something publicly released. Um, but you know, just to show where we are, what we are working on, so we will develop, we will really utilize these interfaces we have. Then we have also for the for all sodium channel disorders videos, and um, we have also have an SCN2 a specific one. I will show you this in a second, and um, then we have also this variant analysis interface. And which we also include now, develop now all the algorithms. Um, and then we have um, these 
more research um, um, tools where you then can look also really for um, where the mutations are located, for example, in STN2. And this is really should um, help a lot of people um, um, which are biologists or drug developers who don't have um, these computational skills um, in um, you know, making sense out of mutations. It so always sounds um, 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 very bad if you say this, but we are really ahead of this field. And when it comes to this bioinformatic analysis and with you now providing this um, to the community that should have a big impact. And then we have, yeah, so we have all these interfaces now for looking at seizure onset and so on and so forth. But I, again, this is um, just the data is not complete yet here and um, we are working about this. And we will also remove the registry because we, in this case, we will work with um, groups like yours and, and to get this information. But so um, so this is in development. Um, and please, um, if you, you probably you see now the link and could go on this, but uh, this um, is, we will have a new version and a different link probably by early, already next week. But again, in October, we will release a very rich version, which we probably have then from, for, the, for all sodium channel genes, probably two and a half thousand patients included. Um, probably 800 functional readouts and um, so like molecular experiments included. And we will have all the genes nicely described in guidelines um, how to, um, how to, what to know about these genes and so on. But it's, we are working on this and many people are working on this at the moment. Um, and I hope, I know I'm certain that by mid-October we have something. Okay. So um, let me close my talk. Um, I took very, spoke very long, I'm sorry for this, but I just let me want to show you at the end um, this SCN2 video. I think, I'm not sure how many languages we have that at the moment. Oh, it's only English, but okay. But we will um, have that also in, um, in more languages available soon. And with this, there's no audio yet, but we're working on this. And um, we are, I already heard that the foundation will support us. And um, let me show you now the SCN2 video.
yeah, so this is um, at the moment um, the video. I think it's uh, I have I saw some things which I want to improve a little bit. And if you have feedback, please um, um, let us know. And the intention is really good, but I know that it's easy to offend someone over a video. Um, if it's um, so, yeah. With this, um, I uh, will close my talk, and and um, I think in two months from now we will have done a ma major step forward in you know making um, the knowledge from research um, accessibly globally. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. That was amazing, and um, it's it's speaking right to us because we have. We've spent a lot of time wondering when a lot of that data was going to be available to us, to our doctors. So to be able to access it all in one place is just going to be such an amazing resource um, for, our, for our families. Um, there was a, a couple of questions that came up in the um, in the chat. Um, Liam, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. I need to scroll back up because I've forgotten. Give me a sec. Uh, yes. So I had one on the Grin portal you showed us, which I guess is just the SCN2A portal. Are you going to have any section where you'll show which medications have helped seizures for which variants and which have worsened or made no change? Something like that? Yeah. So this is a good point. Um, at at the moment, and this is something what we have to develop um, with um, you, you guys and the, the foundation specifically, to which degree we um, want to have this information on the page or if we just link out to, for example, uh, the SN2 family um, foundation webpage. And we want, one thing we have to be a little bit careful um, because of regulations, um, we cannot give treatment recommendation um because that would be against the, the law um but what we could we have an info page we could have an info page but i don't know if that um which is just what types of drugs are typically done but not not for a specific it's not a specific recommendation for a specific variant we, we are not allowed to do this but um i don't know if this info page would then should be on our page or if we just link to um to to you guys I, i'm not sure uh, if uh, do you have an opinion uh, for example uh, liam from your, what would what you what would you think or the the group here? Uh, for me, I would love it to be all in one portal rather than having it separate, and then other families in the future may not be able to source that information. And I'm wondering if we can do it. Uh, you say it's illegal to uh, give treatment options, but can we have it like uh, generalized, more like a statistic or data that this many children? have reacted uh, badly to this drug or better to this drug rather than giving treatment options. So have them as a percentage, I guess. Yeah, I think that would be fair. If we, we do just these groupings um, by, for example, um, children with gain of function or children with early onset, um, we, we could and then we could bring in this information where we have it um, and just see what, who benefited. And yeah. then it's up to the user to figure out um, if they where the individual variant falls into, which would be, you know, you could, yeah. do, you could combine that. Yeah, yeah of course. The reason sense. I Thank ask uh, that question is because my daughter, she's loss of function, struggling with infantile spasms. She's had about six different drugs now. So the, mm -hmm. you know, the first line treatments and then the second line treatments and then keto. So we're kind of... Obviously, our neurologist doesn't know much about SCN2A and there's not a lot online, um, but I've been able to argue with her that she shouldn't be having sodium channel blockers because they've sh been shown to maybe worsen seizures in these kids, but I can't really link her something that uh, will advise the next drug to try. Okay. Yeah. So that's um, the problem I have. I'm not sure how we can solve that. Um. Uh, I will, um, um, I will, so, um, uh, Lea Kala, this video will be um, available, right? Um, if you could share this with me, I will, sh um, this section, um, I will discuss with um, the experts. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a clinician. Um, and, um, but I can share this with the world's experts um, on treating people with loss or gain of function. Um, mm -hmm. Um, as in two way, and um, we will come up with something which um, will help you. Okay, sounds good. 
I think that was my only actual question. Let me have a look. Uh, oh yeah, just wondering, uh, you showed a video on your slides that you said had 4,200 views. Are you able to send a link to that or do you think it's not relevant anymore? Oh, no, I think that, and that's that's definitely um, um, of interest. Um, so if you type in my name into Google, then this will come up um, okay. as you this relatively straightforward. You would only have to look for the word yes, uh, so the opposite of no, because it's the Young Epilepsy Society, um, which um, invited me to speak at that specific session. But yeah, if you type I in my have. name, you will find it. Yeah, I have. Thank you. I'll have a think if I have any more questions and I'll let others have a chat now. So the Latin American, great. Thank you, Liam. Those are great questions. And, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating because the loss of function community, we don't have any um, options, any drug options to go to. There's just, it, especially in the infantile spasms community, um, it seems like there's um, Liam's daughter and my son too, fall into that weird little middle group where you're not gain of function, you're not loss of function, but possibly like a mix and um, nothing seems to work well. You know, we are collecting some of that data, um, Dennis, through the CTRS and um, I'm wondering if Anne can pull it out based on um, function because Al has agreed to um, study the, or at least prioritize the variants that are in that are participating in the CTRS. So we, we might be able to say, you know, their function and then what drugs work um, and maybe maybe somehow pull out that data. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. So um, I, I, I hope that we have enough gravity that everyone um, will automatically contribute. Um, so, and I think Anne, for example, already um, signals that she would be uh, interested in sharing, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the registry data from that project. And I hope that everyone contributes and that we then can um, curate the data in a nice way that everything fits together to some, uh, and, and then have also for more for sub cohorts where we have very detailed data on, you know, um, drug outcomes um, that we maybe see some patterns which may might be there but it didn't emerge yet because we didn't have enough people with the same type of SCN2A um, together that we could see it or we were, we didn't have a good comparison group um, but um, the numbers will be pretty large and I and I hope that that we will have that then yeah but I mean the good thing is to be uh, the, so the, the good thing is you know um, so the S, a lot of things are happening also for SCN8A and SCN1A. And, um, and for example, SCN1A disorders are typically loss of function, the, you know, severe drug B. And um, some lessons learned from there should also be applicable for SCN2A loss of function disorders. And if we have them together, together I think even um, the blindest scientist will see that. And um, maybe that sparks some motivation um, to apply the same kind of methods than also for to S in two way, which can work for Java, for example. Thank you, Carla. I think you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, um, I apologize if you went over this with your slide. Um, when you have the S C N two A variants, I mean, let's say someone in particular. Will it also say a particular case has other variants that could be a contributing factor? Because I feel like that can also be a factor, you know, for treatment. Yeah, so um, we, if that is noted, we can uh, be, we, we, we can display that. So that's, that's so, so basically from a programming point that that's very easy. Um, I, I think for not many, this information is captured in, um, or is collected um, by um, our clinical partners. Um, but so for those who have an exome probably, um, yeah, so if it's there, we can display it and we, um, so yeah. Just, um, just as a person, 
who's doing a lot of research on, um, you know, polygenic epilepsies and so on. It's, it's probably more rare that, uh, or very rare, um, that two variants can um, have a significant effect on STM2 wave. Um, it's probably, if at all, I mean, you know, it's probably more likely that tens of thousands of very tiny effect um, mutations, which every one of us carries, um, modify a little bit the, ex you know, the, ex the how the disease looks. Um, but um, but this is something where we need really whole genomes for um, to um, study this systematically, and this and this, it's unfortunately not really happening. It's a good question, Karma. Thank you. Um, I have one question that came up. Um, what is the difference of the interpretation of the variants that that you showed us, and let, let's say a genetic testing company um, when they do the interpretation? Yeah, so there, there's a set of criteria um, which um, a company or a, a, an individual lab or genetic counselor ha has to take into account. And uh, one of them, for example, does the inheritance mo mode um, fit the gene, for example, or the subtype disorder. Um, you, for example, you would expect that if um, a child has like a very, very extreme disease, where the child individually is, uh, where the variant is that bad that the child has less chance of having children themselves. So you would expect that such a mutation would not be inherited because that mutation um, is so strong, it will make, give you very bad disease. So, um, it's, so that's why this mutation will, will not be passed on. It's just happening. And then in such scenarios, for example, recessive mutations can play a role um, or de novo. And um, typically what we, for example, observe for um, the severe end um, or, um, of SCN2A, they, these are all de novo variants or whether the parent is mosaic. So basically the parent doesn't have it in the brain, um, but most of the time it's um, de novo. Um, so this is one criterion which everyone can apply, right? It's fairly easy. Um, but another big criteria is, um, has another patient been seen with the exact same variant and this requires that you either um, mine the literature, which is not really complete, or you have access to um, all patients which are known. And this is basically what the registry will be, right? So, and this is what uh, an average Joe lab doesn't have access to because they have access to what is in public databases, which is only a tiny percentage compared to what the, um, the um, research registries um, have collected. They have the public data, but they also have all these research um, and um, clinical trial, for example, the data. That's, that's another thing. And probably one of the more ad advanced things is that um, even the people in, in VT, which I know, and, um, and uh, you know they have, uh, we have discussions, um, they are not applying, um, for example, all the computational biology information or, um, or bioinformatics or molecular information they don't integrate it into their um, predictions scheme. They will do it, I'm quite sure, certain, as good as they can in two or three years from now. But um, at the moment, they don't do this much and because they also don't have access to this, all these basic science research um, data. And, and they also, their goal is to be for many diseases quite good instead of for one disease exceptionally good, right? So they don't have the, um, time to focus on one disease and aggregate out information and um, integrate opinions from people, world leaders, right? Who are really um, spending their career on studying how this channel works and so on. However, there's a set of 15 criteria of which I think four to six can be um, tweaked um, that they contain the knowledge of um, people like Al George or Ingo or Rike or um, also what we do. And we can integrate this all and that makes the variant interpretation um, like, uh, if you think about this, like you have all these world experts sitting in a room together and looking at the variant and discussing for 20 minutes and um, what that is. That's some different situation what the company can do um, who doesn't have these world experts. Okay, thank you. So I mean, in a way, this this is deeper. This is a deeper interpretation because it's pulling from yeah. so many, so, so many 
Yeah, for example, one, one very simple example is um, um, if this, you see my hands, right? Um, so if this, for example, would be a scene 2 a what um, one criterion is, uh, one of the strongest criterion is, um, where is the variant located? Let's say if it's in this part of the gene, um, if it's in a functional domain, that's a word, how, how is criteria, then you, it's way more likely to be pathogenic. So this is how the rules work. If it's in a functional domain, because it can, if function is disturbed, it causes probably disease, then um, can, people consider it patho more likely to be pathogenic. However, the word functional domain is, is very ambiguous, can mean anything. And what companies do is they take from these databases where they say, okay, it's in the membrane, the region where the sodium channel is in the membrane. And this is basically half of that thing. So, however, we clearly know that half of um, SC2A is not relevant for disease. It's actually like really fine regions, um, which are probably more like here piece, here piece, here piece, here piece, here piece, and here not, and here piece. And this mapping of where is an important piece, um, we can just can do this with very in, um, advanced informatics, with knowledge from um, experts, and with looking at patient variant um, localization from our from the largest clinical data what we have, and and so on and so forth. And we can even look at where are the gain of function ones and where are the loss of function ones. And this is all what the company cannot do. And um, this is makes the, the um, um, interpretation so much stronger and but the the rep resource will provide all of this thank you so much for that does anyone have any other questions i um i think liam you might have another question please feel free to just unmute yourself and ask uh yeah you may have answered but i'll ask anyway so i'm just wondering uh is it dr dennis uh it was dennis uh, but yeah, yeah just dennis. i have a phd but yeah okay uh, Dennis, how do you collect data for your portal? How can you gather my daughter's data, for instance? Yeah, so um, at, at the moment, so, um, so, so how we did it with the Grin portal is we collaborate with um, the people who do clinical research, who have registries, for example, or, um, um, or they collect um, patient information from um, the literature, um, or where we collect from companies um, their natural history study data. And then we have a group of experts which try to um, harmonize um, all the data, which is not so easy, but it's, for example, seizure onset is relatively straightforward because, um, you know, typically when the first seizure is happening, everyone um, um, goes to the hospital. However, with, for example, um, cognition and um, you know, aut autism that's more hard and that there, there might be different countries that have different procedures. And um, we uh, are trying to do our best to aggregate it. So, and it's basically the short answer is a network of um, research scientists. And um, so your second part of your question is you, um, you can just um, type in, you, uh, or your, your, um, your submit your, uh, your um, daughter's variant and see how that aligns with all other variants. And this is um, a feature which we haven't included for the GRIN. For the GRIN one, you could just get an assessment. This variant has been seen before, or has not been seen before, we think it's pathogenic or not, but you cannot see it with the other variants. So you cannot just com compare eye to eye, but we are currently changing that. So um, that will be not uploaded in the registry. It's just temporal. You will see it on the website, that's it. But we will um, have a shout out on the website, um, depending where you live and also who you prefer. Um, we will um, advertise um, different clinical groups um, we are working with and where you could, for example, which are interested in registering um, participants for research. Um, and um, actually, to be honest, um, we, we, we didn't move to that stage yet. So it could be even that we move there, work directly with the foundation. So um, that's probably, um, it's actually probably the, the better way. I'm sorry for that. So, did, so we, for the sodium channels, we are not on that stage yet where we, we, we took everything, what we have done in research so far, we just aggregated this, and it's, but it's very incomplete data. And we will go with um, what the foundation um, thinks is the best way to approach this. 
But one thing is important, um, we will not directly take data from the public without um, expert curation. Be um, be because um, what happened in the past is um, that um, some um, even like um, neurologists or pediatric neurologists, they um, submit a variant, but turns out um, that they, um, we have a little bit of different opinion on this and we have to ask back and have to check and, um, and to make sure that um, the interpretation, also the clinical interpretation of um, is uh, on the quality of the remaining data. Yep, okay, makes sense. That answers my question, thank you. Yeah, and to be, to be very honest, um, um, the GRIN project was driven by scientists, but the sodium channel po uh, project I see is driven by the foundations. And we just follow um, what you as a group um, tell us to do in the end for these kind of questions. You're amazing, Dennis. We we are so lucky to have you with us. Um, does anybody have any questions or any feedback for Dennis on the video that we watched? I know it was hard to read the captions and watch the video at the same time, but that's going to be changed when, once there's a voiceover. Feel free to send me an email too if you think of anything later. Um, yeah, then, yeah. Have... and then I just put it the link in the chat. And please, um, the, um, I just have to say the intuition we do, we do, we mean well. Um, and if you see problems, um, let us know. We will directly um, put it down or we'll address these changes um, because it's not easy to do these videos. Um, and sometimes you just don't see don't see something. And for example, at the beginning we had. The do all the doctors were males, and we just had because that was the icon selection, which we couldn't get from the gra graphic library, and we didn't. We were not thinking about this until someone pointed that out, and that is an obvious um, problem, and we changed that. But we only see this if someone tells us this. And but the intuition is really that we mean well, just to be. But but you make uh, you make um, errors when you do these things. Of course, no, we understand, and we're so grateful for it. Um, I mean, this this group of parents here, Dennis, you know, we we don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> we we have bigger problems. Um, I do have a question, though. In the very beginning, you were talking about um, it's how important it is to find a clinician that has a deep genetic knowledge, um, and that it, it's kind of hard sometimes to find that that type of doctor for your child. Do you have any, any ways um, of analyzing like different hospitals to see you know who who would be a good genetic epilepsy center to go to yeah but that's actually fairly straightforward um um so there's there 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 are every two years or so there are flagship projects um you know where for example today actually the new scn 8a um um paper came out where they have i think 440 um, patients with scn 8a and um you can see a list of, um, I don't know, 60 um, authors on that. So um, that means that all 60 people who um, um, contributed somehow to this, probably they had each of the individuals had um, a few patients um, they had from their own little registries, which they contributed to this um, bigger effort to understand the disease. And then there are also people like me on this paper who just try to combine certain things. and. All those in, so, so to make a long story short, um, a person who does research on SCN um, 2A is more likely, or is way more likely to, to, to manage um, your child bad, um, good compared to someone where you don't know. When you, if you don't know, um, that person could read a lot, but could also not. And it's more, probably more likely that that person doesn't read a lot. And for um, these uh, epilepsy genes, you need to read a lot. And um, the alternative strategy is academic centers. So um, people who, um, who work at academic centers are more exposed to research. It's very different compared to a local practitioner who runs um, her or his own business since 20 years and is maybe not exposed to what's going on in research. Um, something more specifically, um, I, I think um, that it would be, yeah, I, I don't know. So, um, 
I, I would have some suggestions for for you uh, your, for you, Carla and um, Leah, how you, you could approach this from the foundation that you have like um, some kind of um, scoring on the website, basically which scientists publish or which clinician publishes the most last year, and then by country and by um, um, or um, region in the US, for example, and then you can just score them. And um, people who publish a lot will be the best, um, most informed people. So it's, and that would be if you have a little world map and then and we could help to um to um to optimize that so you don't need to look every day so we can do this computationally um and and, and you yeah so that might be one way but yeah, because i see for me it's re relatively easy um to figure out who's doing research on stn 2 it but that requires some knowledge about how to use scientific databases and so on which is typically not so um straightforward but we could help to, with the foundation to have um, something like this illustrated. That's a great idea. And we have struggled a little bit with this because we we find that a lot of clinicians don't want to be called SCN weight experts um, because you know they only have a handful of patients. Um, but you know, to us, if they have a handful of patients, that's more than most. See, um, so we we did a, a self. Um, well, Carla, what, what what you put something on the website where they could nominate themselves as a as a STN two A expert or a, a doctor that you know treats patients with STN two A. We right. really didn't get a whole lot of people nominating themselves. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. It's it's really not easy. Um, yeah, because the question is who is an expert also at the end, right? So, um, um. Because I think the publication is a good idea, um, and we yeah. can we we very well might take you up on that. So um, we'll we'll reach out. Does anyone have any other questions? I've done a lot of talking this night. Okay. Feel free to just take yourself off mute and ask a question, or raise your hand. Okay. Uh, give us 30 seconds. We'll have a think. Okay. Yep. So you mentioned Dennis four weeks and we'll have our SCN2A portal. Is that correct? Um, latest by mid October. Yes. All right. Uh, when it's available, uh, Leah, will we have the link through the group? Yes. Have you thought about making a tutorial video on how to use the tool? Yes, yes, um, we, we will have that by that time. Okay, great, yep. We'll also have it available in the link tree link as well. So all the research that you can participate in any of the resources that the foundation has. So we'll add that there. Um, it's not really a question, Dennis, but just want to make you aware in Australia, Melbourne, we're currently having a SCN2A natural history study with Dr. Catherine Howell hosting that. Mm -hmm. And from last I heard, there's about 200 plus SCN2A participants already, and that's a natural history study. So they've got a lot of data. I'm not sure if you can connect with them specifically to load up the portal? Oh yeah, so um, so, what I, so what I hope is a little bit the following, and it's very, you know, I'm very honest with the strategy. Um, I hope that that when once we upload it, it will be so big and or so much bigger than everything else before that um, people will just um, ask, hey, if they can participate, because we will also have like a, a list of the end um, with like credits, like you think about a movie, you know, who did what. And um, and scientists like to have their name <laughs> out, right? So, and I hope that um, uh, um, um, many people from, uh, from who have initiatives like um, the one in Australia, just come to us and say, hey, we would like to. Because what I learned in the past is um, if you ask, then that might sometimes be lead to political things and sometimes it's, you know, it, it's sometimes um, tricky, and um, 
I my my I'm very honest, right? So my 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 first strategy is just um, so I so I have already annoyed all the people who are direct in my collaborative uh, network, and they have all all um, agreed, and which is um, very wonderful. And um, we will present this um, then probably already like a first in an internal version end of September and in an iron channel meeting in, in Germany and mid October at the American Society for Human Genetics. So and we will the day the, the day we feel it's ready for public we will put it on Twitter and I have shared it with you already before that we get feedback. Um, and I hope that has will have raised em enough attention because we will also advertise back on the about page very clearly, please join us, um, that um, people will come to us. And um, if people don't come to us, um, um, it's always um, wonderful if people like you send an introductory email and say, hey, you guys should talk and um, see and hope that things work out um, well. That's, that's what I'm thinking. I might have to uh, elicit that conversation because Australia is pretty behind with technology. So I don't have faith that they'll uh, find your product and, and reach out. So I'll see if I can message them when it's up and running and just mention, hey, there's this great tool. Is there any discussion you can have? Yeah, and, and, we, have, and you know, we put then the name of the people and who or whatever um, supported them also on the about page and that they should have then also the credit. And I, I think that's a win-win for everyone. Then. On that note, uh, will you have a contact details through the portal? Yes. Okay, yep. Sounds good. Um, yeah, Liam, let me know if there's anything I can do to help uh, connect there. Does anyone else have any questions? Comments? Awesome. All right, well, it is after nine um, Eastern time, so I will wrap it up. Um, that was an amazing session. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis, for volunteering your time to help us understand your exciting work better. It gives us such hope for our kids' future. Um, uh, thank you to the families who joined us today. Your questions and comments were very insightful. If you're like me, you're gonna go home and think about this and digest it and then maybe have questions later. Just know uh, the, the volunteers and staff at the foundation are here for you. So just send us your questions anytime and we'll do our best to get them answered for you by the professionals. There are five more of these table talks in the RX Hope uh, virtual series. So be sure to register for them in advance. Um, and then we'll make the recordings available as soon as possible. Carlos has been doing a great job of getting those out right away. Um, there's still so much work to be done and we really need to work together. To, to accomplish this. So um, there's two major things going on right now. Um, the annual campaign for the foundation, which ends in just a few days uh, at the end of this month. So if you have not already um, done a Facebook fundraiser or some way of uh, contributing to research, please do so um, in the next few days. And then the other big um, initiative right now is the scn 2 clinical trial readiness study. CTRS, which will feed right into Dennis's work. Um, Carla will put the links on, the, well, they're obviously on our website, but she's also going to, in the video of this recording, in the last 20 seconds, there will be some links in there too, so you can click on those. Okay, that's it. Um, I think you guys have heard my voice enough tonight. Dennis, thank you so, so much, and um, have a great night. Thank you very much. Bye.